Uh, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Wendy P. Young Chen. and of course, happy hour. So I'm very much aware that I'm here between us and beer and vegan pierogies. Are there any gluten-free ones? Gluten-free? Oh, I don't know. Oh, okay. In that case, we got lots of time, people. Um, so um, today, given my own work, um, which is far more in the field of new media studies, I want to think through um, virtual reality um, in terms of the larger lens of new media. So I want to think through um, what Golan earlier was referring to, uh, to the various resurgences of virtual reality um, in terms of changes within new media itself, um, in particular changes to how we view the relationship between new media and reality. Um, so to help us, I want to take you back to cyberspace and to the first-ish emergence of VR. So how many of you remember cyberspace? Excellent, yes. Remember those dreams of bodiless exaltation, those dreams of US console cowboys taking over that vaguely dystopic and Japanified evil future, right? So instead of Japan, now we have China, right? So there's still a yellow peril, but it's different in flavor, right? Um, so of course, we had these dreams that were admittedly and completely hallucinatory, right? So um, references to drugs and punk. I mean, William Gibson coined, of course, the term cyberspace um, before he ever used a computer. Right? So he typed Neuromancer, listening to a lot of punk rock and visiting a lot of video arcades in Vancouver, which is why cyberspace is so seductive and hallucinatory, right? So there's always been an incredibly wide gap between the internet and cyberspace. And Gibson himself was profoundly disappointed when he got his first computer, right? He looked at this white cube and thought, this was it had that worry, how many of you remember that horrible hard drive sound? It annoyed him, right? Um, and I don't think we've registered yet how bizarre it is that an old technology, that TCP IP, became new in the 1990s by allegedly embodying old cyberpunk fiction. And cyberspace VR back then didn't refer to this world. It didn't refer to this reality. Um, cyberspace VR was imagined as a habitat of and for the imagination, right? So it didn't augment reality. It replaced reality. Um, it replaced it with something better. Um, VR wasn't a way to imagine an architecture that wasn't yet built, which is a way, um, a lot of ways that people are selling VR now. Um, it was a way to imagine, to see, to touch architecture that couldn't be built, right? that wasn't buildable. Um, VR wasn't about witnessing what already happened elsewhere. Um, it was about witnessing what couldn't happen, right? And so how many of you have read Neuromancer? Excellent, right? So there was a difference between cyberspace and SimStim. Right? Um, so VR, as Jerome Lanier has argued, um, was about endless experimentation. And there's nothing like revisiting the early Jerome Lanier. <laughs> Um, it was about creating worlds that defy human experience, about communicating without codes, right? It was about creating these worlds on the fly. So how did we move from here, and here you see the early Jerome Lanier um, stuff, um, to here? <coughs> 
how do we move from here to here? Um. <laughs> and VR, right? VR is emerging in a very different media state than before, right? So VR might be back, but cyberspace seems dead, right? It's endless frontiers replaced by echo chambers, replaced by the ways in which we're policed and tethered by our friends. Except cyberspace, even though cyberspace never existed, um, cyberspace isn't quite dead. Right? Cyberspace lives virtually, lives as a memory of something that never occurred. Um, whenever we act as if we're anonymous, even though we know we're not. Um, and this is a really powerful illusion that's in our habits, but also that has been ingrained. Um, so consider Edward Snowden and Citizen Four. So I'm just going to play you a very short clip from Citizen Four, where he explains why he decided to leave. Which one do you want to say? Right. But so if your self-interest is to live in a world in which there's maximum privacy, doing something that could put you into prison in which your privacy is completely destroyed is sort of the antithesis of that. How did you reach the point where that was a worthwhile calculation for you? I remember what the internet was like before it was being watched, and there's never been anything in the history of man that's like it. I mean, you could, again, have children from one part of the world having an equal discussion where, you know, they were sort of granted um, and the same respect for their ideas and conversation with experts in the field from another part of the world on any topic, anywhere, anytime, all of the time. Um, and it was, it was free and unrestrained. And we've seen uh, the, the chilling of that, and the cooling of that, and the changing of that model towards something in which people self-police their own views. And okay. Um, now, although I'm sympathetic to Snowden, I think we need to push back against this nostalgia. Um, now, as I tell my students all the time, critique the work we do, scholarship, isn't about taking what you think is false um, and dissing it. If it was, it's a waste of everybody's time. Um, it's actually taking what you believe to be true, that you're sympathetic towards, and finding its limitations and possibilities. So it's in this light that I want us to do a sympathetic critique of this and VR, as I'll talk about a little later. Um, and we need to push back against this nostalgia, because this internet, this internet in which bodies didn't matter, in which tracking never happened, this internet never existed, right? Hello, the US government built the backbone, right? Um, think of the role that private corporations have had in making Snowden's data valuable. If it wasn't for all those pernicious, unique identifiers, right, his information wouldn't be so valuable. Um, so this internet never existed. And every, every sysop, every sysop should know this, right? Um, so consider, for instance, um, what happens um, whenever you're using a wireless car, right? So right now you're seeing all the data um, my wireless car is reading and writing. Um, so although I'm not doing anything, it's constantly sending information. So your network card, of course, reads in all data and then actively deletes what's not directly addressed to it, which means that you've downloaded all sorts of illegal data. Um, your card works promiscuously. Promiscuous mode, not monogamous mode, is a technical term, right? So if your card was actually monogamous, you would get nowhere, right? Um, and so if you think your network card is monogamous, it's just because it doesn't let your CPU know what it's doing. Right? Um, <laughs> So, new media, as I've been arguing for years, isn't simply about leaks. New media are leaks. New media 
media is leaked at all levels, socially and technologically, right? Not just, but think of all these wonderful signals bouncing off our bodies right now. Think of the ways in which we're constantly reading in each other's data, right? Um, media is wonderfully creepy. Media is wonderfully creepy. At its best, it's wonderfully creepy. Um, but all this is hidden to us, right? Hidden to us by these screens, by these fantasies of technology as, as, as bizarrely personal. Right? Why do we consider this to be personal? Given everything that this is doing right now, um, why? Right? So in truth, um, the only thing that was surprising about Snowden's revelations was that they counted as revelations, right? So here's an article from 2006 documenting the downloading of, of everything off um, the backbone, right? And then you have, of course, Lanier talking about VR as a cross between the commons and the telephone, right, in the 90s. And there he talks very openly about the fact we all know, of course, our metadata is tracked. Um, so against this kind of nostalgia, we need to ask ourselves, how is the internet, how is any technology um, sold as solving our political problems? How is a controlled technology sold as inherently freeing, right? Again, Stobin's terms, a space inherently of freedom. Um, so we need to ask ourselves as we think through technology and VR, is, it, is this hype or isn't it hype, right? Um, is this really true or not? Um, but rather, what does hype do? What does hype do? Because the fact that technology um, is about hype, it ain't really news, right? So the valley lives by the demo. Think of all those great art projects of um, technologies and projects that were never produced. Um, so the more we study technology, the more we realize um, that what we assume, what we accept is true, actually depends on a lot of habits and uh, political decisions. Right? So for instance, um, new media aren't new. Right? If new media were really new, if they were really wonderfully <coughs> strange, if they really were for the first time, they'd be completely ignored. This is why, um, and this is the example I always use because I find it so frustrating. Um, how many of you shop at Trader Joe's? Okay, so they want to introduce a new product. They redesign the entire store, right? Um, because we ignore the new, right? So new media, in order to survive, has to become habitual, right? So new media matter most when they seem not to matter at all when they move from the new and the noteworthy um, to um, the habitual and indeed the obsolescent, right? So how many of you have blackberries? <laughs> exactly. Okay. How many of you though have suffered from phantom vibrations? Okay. So blackberries are dead, but crackberries live on, right? Um, Friendster is gone, but the notion of the friend persists. So the more you study technology, the more you realize that technology doesn't determine anything. Right? So consider again the hype around cyberspace is bodiless exaltation. So the internet was sold in the mid to late 1990s um, as the solution to racial inequality. Um, and let me just show you one of the many commercials um, that were used to advertise the internet. In order to communicate mind to mind, there is no race. There are no genders. There is no age. No age. There are no infirmities. There are only minds. Many minds. Utopia? No. No. The internet. Where minds, doors, and lives open up. Hi, 
the internet without featuring happy people of color, saying there were no happy people of color online, um, as indeed there were or else very few. And those of us online were going around saying, yay, there is no race. Right? Um, but the point of these, and, and these commercials tellingly were pulled from the US market as soon as the internet took off. Um, and in fact, for the longest time, I had to show one in Japan because they kept going on in Japan where internet uh, uptake was actually quite low. Um, so a certain paranoid logic drives these commercials, right? These are about getting people online. It relies on people seeing this and saying, of course, these people would be happy to be online. Um, the message of the commercial isn't even do not discriminate, it's get online if you want to avoid being discriminated against. <laughs> and the message of this commercial is like, if shit, these people are online, so should I. Right? And we have to remember that the same companies airing these commercials were also airing and supporting roundtables about the digital divide. Right? Everybody knew this was hype. Um, so the point, again, um, was not social justice, um, but getting people online. And the point was moving public perception <laughs> and debate away from this, right? So before this, it was like, is the internet really a pornographic bad line? Instead, it was like, is the internet really a race-free utopia, right? One is far more likely to get people online. Um, and in fact, Let's remember that um, back then, it was unclear that anyone would ever go online, right? Um, here you have Clifford Stoll in 1995 explaining why the internet will never take off. Okay. Um, and it was unclear that it would. Um, and the objections that he brings up are still with us, like how safe is sending your credit card? Um, how many people actually visit government documents online? Um, so these critiques are still there. Um, he was right without being right. Um, which brings me to part two. Um, and yeah, how could you forget this, but that, like, you put your credit card online, you're going to die. <laughs> Especially if you order pizza. Um, Okay, so part two, empathy again. Um, now this dream of technology is solving our political problems with us, especially questions of racial equality, um, is still with us. Um, even if the internet is now considered more to be a hotbed of racism than love and peace. Um, so if the internet seems irredeemable, VR isn't. Right? And increasingly, VR is sold as the ultimate empathy machine. I mean, we've heard this over and over and over again. Right? So VR will solve our political problems by creating more empathy. And here you see um, a description of a widely publicized article by British and Spanish scientists. Um, and it documents an experiment in which they had white participants take on black or white bodies and then measure implicit bias both before and after their encounters. Um, and as another um, article explains, one of the encounters was actually seeing um, an African American woman being assaulted and you didn't know your race until you looked at your hands and then seeing whether or not you would intervene. Now the current promises around race and VR feel slightly different, right? So it's not about becoming bodiless, it's about becoming differently embodied. It's, it, it really harkens back to what Lisa Nakamura has called identity tourism. Um, but it's not supposed to be identity tourism because we're empathetic, right? Because somehow we're in their shoes. Um, and the assumption there is that if we just had more empathy, if the world was just more empathetic, then discrimination would disappear. If we just had more empathy, there would be more justice. So that if bad things happen, it's because people don't feel enough or don't feel correctly. Now, many have critiqued these experiments 
Um, but these criticisms have tended to focus on whether or not these experiments really invoke empathy, um, and whether or not you really need an Oculus Rift in order to feel empathy. Um, rarely do they ask, what is the political efficacy of empathy? What is really the political efficacy of empathy? If the end of if, if the end if the goal is the end of racism and discrimination, and this is a big if, right? Think of whenever politicians talk about race or of empathy, right? I do not want Bill Clinton feeling my pain or any part of me whatsoever, right? Um, we need codes of contact around empathy, right? Um, so if, and this is a big if, the end or the goal is the end of discrimination and a more just system, um, we have to ask ourselves, is empathy the answer? Is empathy the answer? Um, and not accidentally, these stories, again, are told from a certain perspective. Think again of who's wearing the glasses and who's being seen. Right? Who's occupying whom in these scenarios? Um, and importantly, many within African American studies and critical race theory have been really critical of empathy, have been really critical of this notion and celebration of empathy. And they've done so by revealing its really long and troubling history. So, Sadia Hartman in particular, um, in her really brilliant scenes of subjection, has analyzed um, the disturbing roles that empathy and violence have played historically within slave narratives. And here you see um, the beginning of her book, where she's talking about um, the, the description of Anne Hester's um, uh, really violent scene um, in the slave narrative. And she says, I've chosen not to reproduce this before you. Um, because as she notes, um, the only thing more disturbing or obscene than the violence um, in the slave narrative is the fact that this violent narrative was demanded over and over again. Every slave had to retell this story of violence. Um, because the story, this reenactment of violence, was key to empathy. Was key to empathy. Um, and so here you see a typical response to those scenes of violence by an abolitionist. Think of those words a little. What exactly is being said here? Right? So, my flighty imagination added much to the tumult of passion by persuading me for the moment that I myself was a slave. And with my wife and children placed under the reign of terror, I began in reality to feel for myself, my wife, my children. So as Hartman notes, this response literally replaces the other with the self. It obliterates the slave's experience and replaces it with the reader's. Right? So what matters is not the slave's pain, but the reader's imagined pain. Um, so to put it most succinctly, if you're in someone else's shoes, you've taken their shoes. They're not human, right? And so, how and why are we viewing this as the grounds for social justice? Um, so this empathy, as Hartman notes, um, however well-meaning, also subjected slaves in more ways than one, right? So it made them once more the object um, to be occupied, and it made justice an issue of white experience. So, part 
Martin asks us, and I think this is a question that's profound and with us in so many ways, um, are we witnesses um, or are we voyeurs? Are we witnesses or are we voyeurs? What is the relationship between witnessing and voyeurs? And given all that we've experienced, given all that we've gone through, um, can we really say that empathy, the lack of empathy, is the problem? So think of how many years we saw people um, being attacked in Sarajevo, right? The ways in which this conflict went on for years, and what happened is that, um, so this was a very dangerous intersection in Sarajevo. Um, and so what journalists would do is just plant themselves at the corner because they knew if they stood there long enough, someone would die. Um, think of all those images. Um, think of all the images of refugees. Is the problem really that we can't inhabit their worldview? What do all these images really do? And I can't tell you how disturbing my students find it. Um, to see these images, certain images, circulated over and over again in social media, how disturbing it is to have to write Black Lives Matter in this day and age. Um, so the point is that this framing has always been suspect. This framing has always been suspect. There's always been a gap between technology and action, and that is a good thing. That's the space for politics. And I think this is what's opened up now with our engagement. By expecting technology to solve our political problems for us, um, we actually also um, are in danger of perpetuating injustice. Right? So think, for instance, of the idea of body cameras as the solution um, to racism. Right? So think of everything this assumes. Um, and think of it in light of everything we already learned from Rodney King, right? in which everything was caught on tape, and yet, and yet, um, and yet, and if this wasn't because the prosecution ignored the video evidence, um, it's because they deconstructed it. They went frame by frame through that video. Right? So think of how the reification of videotaped evidence raises the question, how do we deal with, how do we understand what's not captured? And this is the question that Kimberly Crenshaw raises for us. Right? So by valorizing certain um, evidence as objective, we were relegating others as subjective, right? There were hundreds of complaints registered that year, only one of which was videotaped. And not only does it marginalize all this other evidence as subjective, if you think through it, this makes surveillance what you cannot not want. It makes surveillance what you cannot not want, as though surveillance equals the truth as though if everything were simply transparent, there would be justice. Right? And it leads to the constant circulation of these images, as if what we needed was more evidence rather than more justice. Um, a statement that relies on ignoring almost everything that we've learned about social media. Right? So think about stupid this assault was posted on Twitter. There were updates on social media. Um, and what this points to is that this old enlightenment idea uh, that if people just knew or felt the truth, then people would act properly. Um, this is what's being fundamentally called into question. Um, if, of course, this was ever true. This gets me to part three, reality even weirder than we are. Okay. Um, now, arguably, what
What's really weird isn't this. Um, what's really weird isn't VR. What's really weird um, is the reality we live in. Right? A reality that surpasses fiction, that makes cyberpunk fiction look the now. Right? A world of towering echo chambers. A world in which US politician calls on Russian hackers. Right? Um, a world in which reality has become an adjective for highly franchised and scripted TV shows. A world in which highly scripted politicians become real when posing next to real actors who play them or play them off, right? So Hillary Clinton becomes real when she's on Saturday Night Live. A world engaged in massive and endless self-surveillance um, in which Big Brother is an endless source of pleasure and entertainment. A world in which monetary transactions are social media. Right? How many of you are men? Yeah, you know, it was Marx who said that money was a social transaction, right? So a capitalist world uh, filled with Marxist insights. This is a really strange world to me. Um, a world of big data, right? A world in which endless data analytics means that screens don't matter, um, that we don't need to be online to be computed, that we're finally through the looking glass. Um, and uh, Nigel Thrift has come up with the term calculation um, to describe the ways in which even when we appear not to be online, the whole world around us is vibrant and constantly computed, right? We have a very different relationship to, to what appears to be the other side of the screen. Um, and consider in this light all the work being done on the military and PTSD. Um, now I'm sure that you're all familiar with the various um, programs developed to help soldiers with PTSD. How many of you have not seen video of it? Um, so um, I'm going to show you a different military video, but if, if you want, I can show you the virtual Iraq um, part of it. Yeah. yeah. I think that had the biggest impact on me was a particular patrol that went on. It was after to be Father's Day. There was a firefight, and uh, there was a couple of water trucks that were delivering water to this particular village that day. And uh, in the middle of the firefight, you know, they decided they were going to break cover and, and try to leave the area. We had just had a suicide guy pull out of an alleyway and detonate on us. And uh, we, we couldn't be sure that that wasn't going to happen again. So immediate course of action was to stop the vehicle at all costs. And it killed a 16-year-old boy and his father particularly difficult to deal with because I had a, I had a son that age. It's, it struck home. I went home and I don't really think I noticed I had a problem. But my wife would tell you I never smiled. We didn't talk as much. A good example is she sent me to the store when I first got back. And, uh, to, and we were at Walmart. And she said, can you go get some toilet paper? Sure, I meandered over to the toilet paper aisle. There was like 50 kinds of toilet paper and I could not make a simple decision. I could, it, I almost had a nervous breakdown right in Walmart. I, it for some reason frazzled me because it's just not the life, I'm not used to, I mean it's so simple but it was such a hard decision to make. I talked to the division psychiatrist We go on over. What was you can't see this doctor. You can hear him. He would ask me, you know, to talk about it. At intermittent intervals, they introduce explosions and gunfire.
It's tough. It's tough because you've spent so much time trying to avoid thinking about your deployment and they're drudging up these memories that you've tried to avoid at all costs. It's, it's difficult. I think it was a great idea for them to, to put treatment in that format. Better than probably just sitting there and, and trying to have some doctor pull the events out of you, you know, you're, you're right there, boom, smack, face to face with, with your worst demons. I mean, am I 100% better? No, I wouldn't say I was 100% better. But I do have my life back. I'm able to do a lot of the things that I did before. You know, I don't have so many issues. I'm not running around angry all the time. And this treatment was, you know, it saved my life probably. It saved my marriage for sure. So I would say if you ask me if it works, yeah, it works. So um, that, he was one person who was um, treated with um, virtual Iraq. Um, and here you see um, a paper from the people at USC who developed that. Um, and what's important and what that narrative shows is the idea of reliving this event that actually um, hasn't quite been processed, right? So each session, um, they produce this narrative together. Um, there's ways in which various things come up. And they're also given homework, right? So they're taking, uh, they're given these tapes um, to re-listen to over and over again, right? And what that clip makes clear is it's through this that one tries to actually live through it, to come up with a, a, a script or a narrative to make sense of something which seems not to make sense at all. Um, what I want to point out, though, is that if it's effective, we have to ask ourselves to what extent is it effective because of the extent to which war and media have always been so intimately intertwined. Um, so consider this story um, of an Israeli soldier right, and his experiences in war. Um, and this is from an earlier time, but he notes at the beginning it was fine, it just felt like war cinema. <coughs> But where things actually fell apart was when it wasn't like cinema. When he saw a pile of corpses, huh? and that was something he had never seen in a war film. So things fell apart when reality didn't follow the script. And importantly, this kind of VR therapy works best with younger soldiers who are themselves trained using VR. Um, and so, just to show you a very brief clip, um, this is, comes from the same um, larger group at USC. This is also... Eagle 1-6, this is 2-6. I'm about two blocks from my assembly point. This is before the ETA. Your location, 2-0 minutes over. Um, so, this is what happened when the Israeli soldiers were trying to get to the Deal with these situations. 
situations. So if these work, there's an incredible knitting together of VR and R. Right? Um, and so weird reality indeed. Um, and it would seem through our technologies um, that reality has become the laboratory, that things have become fundamentally switched. Um, perhaps, perhaps. But what's weird is also what's magical. Um, and the term weird as we now use it came from the fact um, the weird sisters of the Fed. So it invokes what's supernatural, um, what's beyond human, what's uncanny, what's uncomfortable and strange, what's weird and wonderful. Um, so the fictional, the virtual, has always argued with the closest to what's true. Right? Those moments in fiction where we read something that's fictional and yet so true. And maybe, just maybe, the world is so weird, so impoverished, because we've conflated what's actual with what's true. And maybe, just maybe, this is why VR is so important. Um, so as Anne Freeberg has argued, um, the virtual was never simply the computational. And drawing from the work of Bergson, and here you see Deleuze drawing from Bergson as well, he points out that the virtual, like memory itself, um, is real. Right? It's real. And the term virtual reality comes from Antonin Artaud and his um, description of theater and its double. So his notion of theater is open. Is something, and here's the, where the term the virtual arts and the virtual reality came from. Um, they don't carry their annual reality within themselves. But also, of course, to his description of the theater of cruelty. And the idea that if this was some sort of virtual reality, it's not because it enables us a certain empathy, but an acknowledgement or experience of something that's absolutely inhuman. And this is why he was against psychological or voyeuristic theater. And it's through this inhuman lens um, that I want us to rethink certain episodes that we perhaps too easily call empathy. Um, and I'm just going to uh, leave the video or be another, um, the machine to be another, the gender swap. Um, um, and what's remarkable here um, isn't simply that you take on another experience, right? It's very different than the experiment discussed earlier, but rather um, a moment of negotiation of not only the other person, but also of the inhuman technology itself, the uncanniness of the technology. And it's in this light as well that I would have us recall Fox Herald's work and the ways in which he thinks through various monsters or species as a way to get us thinking through um, questions of microaggression. Um, and it's in this light as well that I'd like us to return to Lanier and his notion of virtual reality as a cross between a commons and a telephone. What here is being claimed as common? Um, and I want to leave this with us and have us think through um, the gap and to realize that the gap between hype and reality, the gap between promise and reality, isn't the space for cynicism or despair, but rather the space for creativity, for political action, and for justice. Thank you.